Welcome to the channel, Legendary Legacy, book recap audio, where you can enjoy the summaries of the best audiobooks without spending a penny. Today, we will recap the book, And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. First, there were ten a curious assortment of strangers summoned as weekend guests to a little private island off the coast of Devon. Their host, an eccentric millionaire unknown to all of them, is nowhere to be found. All that the guests have in common is a wicked past they're unwilling to reveal and a secret that will seal their fate. For each has been marked for murder. A famous nursery rhyme is framed and hung in every room of the mansion, ten little boys went out to dine, one choked his little self and then there were nine. Nine little boys sat up very late, one overslept himself and then there were eight. Eight little boys traveling in Devon, one said he'd stay there then there were seven. Seven little boys chopping up sticks, one. Chopped himself in half and then there were six. Six little boys playing with a. Hive, a bumblebee stung one and then there were five. Five little boys going in for law, one got in chancery and then there were four. Four little boys going out to sea, a red herring swallowed one and then there were three. Three little boys walking in the zoo, a big bear hugged one and then there were two. Two little boys sitting in the sun, one got frizzled up and then there was one. One little boy left all alone, he went out and hanged himself and then there were none. When they realize that murders are occurring as described in the rhyme, terror mounts. One by one they fall prey. Before the weekend is out, there will be none. Who has choreographed this dastardly scheme? And who will be left to tell the tale? Only the dead are above suspicion. The recap audiobook episodes are published on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and other podcast platforms. You can tell us more information about any book you would like us to have an audiobook. About. Please leave your book info below in the video comments, new recap. Episodes are published on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday every week. If you find this content useful, please support our channel by liking, commenting on the video, following, subscribing, and sharing this content with your friends and relatives so that we have more motivation to produce more audiobook episodes with the best and latest quality. Thank you for listening and have a nice day. Full Book Summary Eight people, all strangers to each other, are invited to Indian Island, off the English coast. Vera Claythorne, a former governess, thinks she has been hired as a secretary, Philip Lombard, an adventurer, and William Bloor, an ex-detective, think they have been hired to look out for trouble over the weekend, Dr. Armstrong thinks he has been hired to look after the wife of the island's owner. Emily Brent, General MacArthur, Tony Marston, and Judge Wargrave think they are going to visit old friends. When they arrive on the island, the guests are greeted by Mr. and Mrs. Rogers, the butler and housekeeper, who report that the host, someone they call Mr. Owen, will not arrive until the next day. That evening, as all the guests gather in the drawing room after an excellent dinner, they hear a recorded voice accusing each of them of a specific murder committed in the past and never uncovered. They compare notes and realize that none of them, including the servants, knows Mr. Owen, which suggests that they were brought here according to someone's strange plan. As they discuss what to do, Tony Marston chokes on poisoned whiskey and dies. Frightened, the party retreats to bed, where almost everyone is plagued by guilt and memories of their crimes. Vera Claythorne notices the similarity between the death of Marston and the first verse of a nursery rhyme, Ten Little Indians, that hangs in each bedroom. The next morning the guests find that Mrs. Rogers apparently died in her sleep. The guests hope to leave that morning but the boat that regularly delivers supplies to the island does not show up. Bloor, Lombard, and Armstrong decide that the deaths must have been murders and determine to scour the island in search of the mysterious Mr. Owen. They find no one, however. Meanwhile, the oldest guest, General MacArthur, feels sure he is going to die and goes to look out at the ocean. Before lunch, Dr. Armstrong finds the general dead of a blow to the head. The remaining guests meet to discuss their situation. 
they decide that one of them must be the killer. Many make vague accusations, but Judge Wargrave reminds them that the existing evidence suggests any of them could be the killer. Afternoon and dinner pass restlessly, and everyone goes to bed, locking his or her door before doing so. The next morning, they find that Rogers has been killed while chopping wood in preparation for breakfast. At this point, the guests feel sure the murders are being carried out according to the dictates of the nursery rhyme. Also, they realize that the dining room table initially featured ten Indian figures, but with each death one of the figures disappears. After breakfast, Emily Brent feels slightly giddy, and she remains alone at the table for a while. She is soon found dead, her neck having been injected with poison. At this point, Wargrave initiates an organized search of everyone's belongings, and anything that could be used as a weapon is locked away. The remaining guests sit together, passing time and casting suspicious looks at each other. Finally, Vera goes to take a bath, but she is startled by a piece of seaweed hanging from her ceiling and cries out. Bloor, Lombard, and Armstrong run to help her only to return downstairs to find Wargrave draped in a curtain that resembles courtroom robes and bearing a red mark on his forehead. Armstrong examines the body and reports that Wargrave has been shot in the head. That night, Bloor hears footsteps in the hall, upon checking, he finds that Armstrong is not in his room. Bloor and Lombard search for Armstrong, but they cannot find him anywhere in the house or on the island. When they return from searching, they discover another Indian figure missing from the table. Vera, Lombard, and Bloor go outside, resolving to stay in the safety of the open land. Bloor decides to go back into the house to get food. The other two hear a crash, and they find someone has pushed a statue out of a second-story window, killing Bloor as he approached the house. Vera and Lombard retreat to the shore, where they find Armstrong's drowned body on the beach. Convinced that Lombard is the killer, Vera steals Lombard's gun and shoots him. She returns to her bedroom to rest, happy to have survived. But upon finding a noose waiting for her in her room, she feels a strange compulsion to enact the last line of the nursery rhyme, and hangs herself. The mystery baffles the police until a manuscript in a bottle is found. The late Judge Wargrave wrote the manuscript explaining that he planned the murders because he wanted to punish those whose crimes are not punishable under law. Wargrave frankly admits to his own lust for blood and pleasure in seeing the guilty punished. When a doctor told Wargrave he was dying, he decided to die in a blaze, instead of letting his life trickle away. He discusses how he chose his victims and how he did away with Marston, Mr. and Mrs. Rogers, MacArthur, and Emily Brent. Wargrave then describes how he tricked Dr. Armstrong into helping him fake his own death, promising to meet the doctor by the cliffs to discuss a plan. When Armstrong arrived, Wargrave pushed him over the edge into the sea, then returned to the house and pretended to be dead. His ruse enabled him to dispose of the rest of the guests without drawing their suspicion. Once Vera hanged herself on a noose that he prepared for her, Wargrave planned to shoot himself in such a way that his body would fall onto the bed as if it had been laid there. Thus, he hoped, the police would find ten dead bodies on an empty island. Full book analysis Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None is one of the world's best-selling mystery novels, although it defies many tropes of the mystery genre. Christie includes, for example, no Poirot-like detective to solve the mystery and unmask the killer. Nor are the victims innocent of a crime. In Christie's novel, the victims are deemed guilty and receive justice, albeit through the actions of a murderer. No one, as the novel's major conflict reveals, is innocent. Ten strangers die because a murderer judges them guilty of past crimes. Christie thus offers a unique take on both guilt and justice, revealing that guilt can manifest and be perceived in many ways. The novel opens with shifting perspectives that reveal the character's inner thoughts. By using this atypical narrative style, Christie allows readers to gain direct insight into all the characters without using the filter of an omniscient narrator. The inner ruminations of the characters help create an air 
of intrigue, as it becomes clear that each has something to hide. Each character recalls incidents from the past, generally in vague terms, without expressing much guilt for what they have done. In the novel's inciting incident, the nature of their unacknowledged guilt is revealed, a disembodied voice accuses each of the ten strangers on the island of murder, providing details of their purported crimes. This explicit declaration of guilt by an unknown figure sets the events of the novel into motion, revealing how each character perceives his or her guilt and how this perception ultimately determines their fate. Through the novel's rising action, the people on the island are murdered one after another in ways that mirror the Ten Little Indians rhyme, which becomes a recurring motif. When asked to offer a defense against the accusations, each character responds differently, showing the level of guilt they feel. Marston, who dies first, does not express much remorse, instead insisting that what happened was simply an accident. Vera, Armstrong, Bloor, Rogers, and MacArthur all deny the accusations made against them, while Emily Brent refuses to speak about the accusations entirely. Only Lombard accepts the truth of the accusation, yet he expresses no feelings of guilt. He believes that his actions were justified and asserts that his own life is worth more than the lives of the native people he abandoned to die. These varied perceptions of guilt, from denial to self-justification, ultimately determine each character's fate and establish the sequence in which they will die. As the plot unfolds, Christie's periodic use of shifting perspectives helps reveal the characters' true feelings, including their awareness of both degrees of guilt and sense of justice. Wargrave admits no guilt for the Edward Seaton incident. MacArthur, despite lying earlier, feels guilty as accused, and he feels a sense of peace at the admission, longing to remain on the island. He seems to welcome death because he views his own murder as an extension of justice, a means with which to assuage guilt and atone for what he has done. Vera, in contrast, personally denies the accusations made against her, while her emotional responses reveal the truth. As she becomes aware that the sequential murders resemble the lines of the rhyme, she becomes increasingly disturbed, approaching hysteria. She hallucinates sounds and smells from her past, and she finally admits to herself that she consciously sent Cyril to his death. A frenzy of activity occurs following the novel's climax, when Vera finally shoots Lombard. Even though she recognizes her own guilt in the heinous crime of causing an innocent child's death, Vera expresses initial relief and a sense of vindication when she becomes the sole survivor on the island. Her guilt, however, has been chipping away at her psyche and finally overcomes her, leading her to take her own life when she discovers the noose over her bed. Following the events of the climax, the novel's falling action once again subverts a significant trope of the mystery genre. Readers have clues as to why the murders have taken place, but they remain in the dark as to who committed them and what the real motivations might be. The police remain baffled by events and have no explanations to offer. It is only in the events of the resolution that these final mysteries are solved, when it becomes clear that perceptions and manifestations of guilt, coupled with a sense of justice, have played a part in sealing each character's fate. Wargrave, when his manuscript is discovered, is finally revealed to be the murderer, and he has not absolved himself from blame. He does not hold himself guilty of any crime in the Seton incident, but, in keeping with his judgment of the others, he holds himself guilty of their deaths, taking his own life. His assessment of the other's guilt has directed the order and manner in which he takes each life, according to his own sense of justice. The characters he deems as having the least degree of guilt have died first, while the more serious offenders have been put through a longer ordeal. Lombard and Vera, whose deaths did not occur directly at Wargrave's hands, die last because Lombard has accepted accountability for his actions but felt no guilt, and Vera is guilty of the worst crime in Wargrave's eyes, ultimately acting as her own executioner. And then there were none quotes. Quote number one, in the midst of life, we are in death. Quote number two, but no artist, I now realize, can be satisfied with art alone. There is a natural craving for recognition which cannot be gainsaid. Quote number three, I don't know. 
I don't know at all. And that's what's frightening the life out of me. To have no idea. Quote number four, crime is terribly revealing. Try and vary your methods as you will, your tastes, your habits, your attitude of mind, and your soul is revealed by your actions. Quote number five, it had come about exactly in the way things happened in books. Quote number six, the amount of missing girls I've had to trace and their family and their friends always say the same thing. She was a bright and affectionate disposition and had no men friends. That's never true. It's unnatural. Girls ought to have men friends. If not, then there's something wrong about them. Quote number seven, one little Indian left all alone, he went out and hanged himself and then there were none. Quote number eight, one of us in this very room is in fact the murderer. Quote number nine, there was something magical about an island, the mere word suggested fantasy. You lost touch with the world, an island was a world of its own. A world, perhaps, from which you might never return. Quote number 10, be sure thy sin will find thee out. Quote number 11, best of an island is once you get there, you can't go any farther, you've come to the end of things. Quote number 12, and then there were none. Quote number 13, you can't save someone who doesn't want to be saved. Quote number 14, fear, what a strange thing fear was. Quote number 15, that's peace, real peace. To come to the end, not to have to go on. Yes, peace. I hope you found my, and then there were none by Agatha Christie, recap summary helpful to your experience. The recap audiobook episodes are published on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and other podcast platforms. You can tell us more information about any book you would like us to have an audiobook about. Please leave your book info below in the video comments. New recap episodes are published on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday every week. If you find this content useful, please support our channel by liking, commenting on the video, following, subscribing, and sharing this content with your friends and relatives so that we have more motivation to produce more audiobook episodes with the best and latest quality. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.